With the COVID-19 pandemic upon us, the faculty of Columbia University School of Social Work have mobilized to form the COVID-19 Action Group with the mission of monitoring developments and disseminating information that can be helpful to social workers um, and our interdisciplinary colleagues and the clients that we serve. Um, and these trainings are, um, are being offered in collaboration with other with, with other with other with faculty members from other schools, which we've been just really getting really excited to offer. So today's um, presentation on COVID nineteen in the labor market, we're really um, pleased and excited to have our guest presenter, um, Jordan um, Matsudora. Um, he's an associate professor of economics and education at Teachers College with Columbia University. And so with that, I want to turn it over to him. Uh, great. Thank you, Tiffany, and good morning, everybody. Um, so as Tiffany was saying, today I'm uh, going to talk about um, a really big topic, which is just how um, this, this uh, crisis has been affecting the labor market, and, uh, and then focus on how the unemployment insurance system uh, in particular um, has been uh, tinkered with to try to respond to the unfolding crisis uh, as we go along. So, um, you know, one thing I want to say is it's a big topic and, um, you know, the, the pace of research that people are doing to try to understand exactly uh, how this crisis is going to unfold and affect the economy in the long term um, uh, is changing from day to day. And so there, there's so much going on and there's so much new research going on. What I'm going to try to do today is try, just try to uh, kind of summarize some of the, the major points just about what's happened, how the, um, how the crisis has affected uh, the labor market, um, what uh, the kind of major policy responses have been and what we know about how successful those responses have been in, in trying to help workers, um, and, uh, and then try to look into the crystal ball a bit and, and predict the future to some extent. Think about um, what the future of the labor market is going to look like and um, what kinds of policies need to be adopted um, to really prevent further um, or at least mitigate further economic harm. Um, because this is going to be a pretty high level overview, um, I do uh, want to encourage people if, if there are topics that I haven't gotten to or questions that you have, um, if those are in, included in the chat or, or um, uh, otherwise communicated um, to me, I'll do my best to, to respond to some of those things and presumably there's a mechanism where uh, when the slides are shared I can include some answers to questions and, and perhaps links to other resources and research that people might find helpful. Um, okay, so um, I mentioned uh, uh, this, the, the overview of what I'm going to talk about today is just talk about, um, again, just the nature of how this COVID public health crisis has turned into an employment crisis, um, just kind of summarize what's happened uh, to the labor market um, and why we think uh, uh, it's impacted workers in the way that it has. Uh, and then move on to talk about policy responses with a focus on unemployment insurance. Think about whether the unemployment insurance system that we have is really up to the challenge of protecting workers from the harm uh, of this um, uh, COVID crisis induced recession uh, that we're now going through. Um, thinking about what the future holds uh, and then again, think about um, policy uh, priorities going forward. So let's start with uh, just an overview. Um, so uh, the, the figure that I, that I have here on the screen is, is just depicting the number of new cases that have been confirmed uh, in the United States. So as people uh, are aware, no doubt, um, the first case uh, of COVID was detected back in February. Uh, the crisis began to spread in March. Um, so the number of cases hit uh, 300 in the, or sorry, 100 in the United States on March 3rd and then just exploded. Uh, in the next week, uh, it went from 100 to 1,000 confirmed cases. 10 days later, we crossed 10,000. And just a week later, we crossed 100,000 uh, confirmed cases. Uh, people started to react to this. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that we started to react uh, too slow, slower than would have been ideal. Um, but uh, localities started to close down restaurants uh, and other businesses on an ad hoc basis um, starting around the second week of March. Uh, and then by the third week of March, we had California lead uh, with a statewide stay at home order uh, and 21 other states followed uh, in the next week and uh, in the weeks that followed a lot of other states did. So uh, we really had uh, this COVID crisis really slamming on the brakes uh, of the economy by state order because states governments were trying to enforce um, uh, 
social distancing by really shutting down all but uh, uh, necessary and essential uh, businesses. So we see that that public health crisis turned into an employment crisis. So the, the figure uh, in the bottom right of the slide is showing uh, the weekly unemployment claims that have been filed by American workers uh, over the course of uh, this past year, back to January. And you can see that in the, the first um, uh, three months, uh, two and a half months of, of the year, the United States has been enjoying one of the, the strongest uh, labor markets uh, in its history. So uh, employment had been growing for more than 10 years straight since the end of the Great Recession back in uh, 2010. Um, and uh, unemployment had been at an all-time low, and uninsurance claims uh, had also been at an all-time low. Uh, not to say that there weren't a lot of people struggling, not to say that there wasn't a lot of inequality, but um, by historical standards, the United States labor market was uh, in about as strong as a position as it had been uh, in quite some time. So uh, after averaging uh, about 211,000 claims every week uh, for the first two and a half months of the year, you started to see that number tick up in the second week of March. Uh, and then in the third week of March, um, things just exploded. So as uh, uh, state and local uh, shutdown orders went into place, workers weren't allowed to go into work, you saw unemployment insurance claims just explode. So they rose to 3.3 million. That's a number that had never been recorded in the history uh, of the unemployment insurance uh, system. Uh, and then in the following week, uh, they rose to almost 7 million uh, and stayed that, uh, that high for another two weeks. And then it's been uh, tapering since um, mid-April. Uh, uh, but just this morning, uh, the um, unemployment insurance claims for last week were announced, and we still had 1.5 million uh, uninsurance claims being filed. Just to give some context for how uh, unprecedented that, that is, that 1.5 million number is the lowest number of the crisis so far. But at 1.5 million, that makes still 12 consecutive weeks where we've had more than twice the number of unemployment insurance claims that the economy ever experienced in the Great Recession between 2007 and 2010. Okay, so this is uh, an employment crisis of unprecedented scale. If you've been following uh, uh, the news, you've seen that economists and others have really struggled to find some way of putting uh, what we're experiencing right now in context. So uh, an unpre unprecedented crisis, uh, unprecedented graphics, um, uh, creativity from uh, the, the New York Times front page department. Um, so you can see that the recession is really unique. So the, the figure that you're looking at goes back to the 19, um, uh, to, uh, to about 2000. Uh, here in the middle, you see the blip uh, in uninsurance claims that happened uh, over uh, the course of the Great um, Recession. Okay, you have to go back even further, almost to the Great Depression, where you find numbers that are even uh, uh, vaguely comparable in scale. Um, so the, the crisis has really brought about unprecedented numbers of job losses. And the thing that's really distinctive about this recession and what makes it um, uh, very hard to predict what's going to happen in the future is just that we've never had a recession like this, where economic activity really ground to a halt, basically in one week. Okay, so over the course of one week, uh, you went from unemployment insurance claims that were about 300,000 uh, to uh, a number that was 10 times that much at almost 3.3 million. Uh, and the United States has really never seen that kind of abrupt stop uh, before in its history. Um, uh, when we moved into April, okay, um, uh, there's a monthly jobs report that the Bureau of Labor, Labor Statistics at the Department of Labor puts out. Uh, April has been the worst month uh, of the recession and really one of the worst months uh, in the economic history of the United States. Uh, more than 20 million uh, people lost their jobs in April and unemployment rose to 14.7%. Okay, again, the only number uh, uh, that rivals that um, in, in magnitude is uh, the, the number of people who are unemployed during the Great Depression. Um, now, I, I won't go into um, some of the measurement issues uh, uh, today, but there are a lot of reasons to believe that even these uh, numbers, which are based on the official statistics released by the Department of Labor, 
um, even these numbers are uh, uh, understating the degree to which uh, employment uh, fell and unemployment rose. Okay? So that's not uh, uh, any kind of um, nefarious conspiracy to hide uh, what's going on. It's just that a lot of the, the machinery that we have to really measure the state of the economy doesn't function well in times uh, of massive change like this. People don't report questions in, in, in the way that um, the question designers intended them to be answered. And because of that, it's difficult to, to really get an accurate measure. Um, but the, the patterns here tell a, a, a very consistent story. Now, um, uh, we can see in this figure uh, that the patterns of job loss were perhaps predictably um, uh, varied by uh, race and gender. Uh, so this figure shows um, the change in unemployment rates for uh, white workers and uh, versus black workers and men versus women uh, of each race. And you can see that uh, uh, unemployment rose. So one of the things that's also distinctive about this uh, recession is that uh, although the increases um, in unemployment for black men and black women have been uh, high and higher um, uh, than, uh, than they have been for, uh, for white men and women, uh, the increases for white men and women have really been uh, quite large as well. And we haven't seen uh, the kind of increases in the disparities on, in unemployment that we've seen, for example, in the Great Recession or other recessions in the past, which tend to be much, much more in a relative sense uh, uh, concentrated among uh, minority workers. Um, not shown in this figure, um, but uh, Latinx workers uh, also saw unemployment uh, rates uh, increase to very high levels as did uh, Asian workers, although the numbers are a little bit noisier uh, and hard to make sense of for um, some of the smaller um, uh, race and ethnic uh, 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 subgroups. Uh, the figure here shows um, the patterns in unemployment uh, uh, among foreign-born workers, so immigrant men and women versus U.S.-born uh, men and women. And you can see um, that uh, the, the green and light blue uh, figures here uh, have increased to higher levels. So foreign-born workers are also suffering uh, higher um, degrees of job loss compared to their native-born counterparts. Uh, and then lastly, um, the, uh, if you look at uh, who's been losing their jobs as a function of how much uh, they were earning prior to being laid off, uh, we also see really big differences uh, across the earnings distribution where uh, people who are in the bottom uh, quintile of earnings, okay, uh, uh, measured in early March before the crisis set in, uh, have seen much, much greater job losses than people in the, <laughs> the top quintile of, uh, of the earnings uh, distribution. So for people who uh, are amongst the bottom 20% uh, of wage earners, we saw declines in employment of almost 35%. Uh, whereas for people in the top quintile uh, of the earnings distribution, uh, we see um, declines of less than 10%. Okay, so the crisis is really uh, turned into an employment crisis much more at the low end of the distribution of earnings that it has at the high end. Now, um, explaining these patterns is, is complicated, obviously, um, but one of the really, uh, one of the largest factors in, in um, ex explaining the patterns that we've seen by race, gender, uh, and nativity uh, in prior earnings levels has to do with just which industries have been hit the hardest uh, by this by this crisis. And uh, if you think about um, the sorts of industries where social distancing is difficult, where there's a lot of contact between uh, uh, workers and customers, um, then those tend to be the industries where employment has really suffered the most because it's hard for them to continue to do business and that's where the layoffs uh, of workers have been the greatest. So you can see in the figure here, leisure and hospitality, so that's restaurants, that's hotel workers, um, things of that nature. We've seen declines uh, uh, in employment of almost 50%, so just massive, massive um, um, job layoffs in that sector. Uh, construction uh, and retail uh, are some of the other uh, uh, big sectors that employ a lot of workers and have seen uh, large, um, large job losses. Okay, so these industries uh, employ a lot of um, the, uh, the minority uh, and uh, low, lower wage workers. And because job losses have been so concentrated in these industries, um, that explains a lot of the patterns that you see by different worker demographics uh, at the same time. 
Now, if, if you've been, again, following the news in the last week or so, uh, you may have seen um, that there was uh, really a surprising bit of economic news that came out. So again, uh, the first week of every month, the Department of Labor announces, um, the, kind of releases the official data on what's happened to the economy in the last month. So we saw uh, in April, we had the massive um, uh, kind of job loss of, of over 20 million jobs. And economists had been predicting that that was going to continue, that in May, um, uh, job losses were expected to be uh, on the order of about 7 million jobs lost, and the unemployment rate would continue to rise to almost 20%. Okay? Contrary to those expectations, um, the, the economy appears to have actually added jobs uh, in May, and unemployment fell uh, uh, by about uh, one percentage point, down to 13.3%. Uh, now, um, to say this as a surprise, uh, as this uh, kind of headline um, uh, uh, alludes to here, is an understatement. Uh, the reaction that I think um, uh, kind of captured the sentiment uh, of economists the most is shown here uh, below uh, from uh, a colleague of mine, Kate Bond, who uh, directs um, the Washington Center for Equitable Growth um, and does uh, labor economics research there. So this has really left uh, a lot of economists um, scratching their heads about whether this rebound is um, uh, really going to last uh, or whether this is just a blip in the data, perhaps some noise um, to explain. Okay? But um, you know, so you, you've kind of seen predictable uh, kind of celebrating of those numbers um, across the um, uh, people of different party lines. Uh, so some people have uh, kind of emphasized the, the huge uh, growth in jobs. Okay, so that the increase in jobs of 2.5 million uh, jobs is one of the largest increases uh, in employment that the country's ever seen again. Um, so a historic increase in job numbers, and, and that's, uh, you know, rightly been, been, um, been celebrated. But uh, it's important uh, to note, okay, um, that uh, we've lost uh, more than uh, 22 million jobs uh, altogether. And so that 2.5 million uh, increase uh, in jobs that we saw in the last month, Okay, even if it holds, is only uh, a recovery of about 10% um, of the jobs um, that were lost overall. Okay, so we're still in a really deep hole uh, with the economy. And even though it's likely that over the recovery, we're going to see really big job gains from, uh, from month to month, or, or at least that's what we're hoping for, even really large job uh, uh, gains numbers uh, are, are still not telling the tale of what's going on in the economy. We're still about uh, 19 million jobs below uh, the peak uh, that we had, and, and the level of employment has reverted almost all the way back to where it was in 2012. Okay, so we've essentially erased uh, almost eight years of, of uh, job growth, uh, even with the increase in jobs that we saw in May. Okay, looking at the same figure, uh, or, or looking at the same uh, uh, type of data, but for the unemployment rate. Okay, so we saw the unemployment rate uh, uh, edge back downwards uh, from about 14.7% to 13.3%. But still, if you look at um, the, the, his, the history of that time series going all the way back to 1948, okay, we're still at a higher level of unemployment um, than we've been at uh, at any point in time since the Great Depression. Okay, so it's important uh, to keep sight of the fact that even though uh, we saw a little bit of a rebound in May, um, the big picture here is that the economy is in a massive hole um, and, uh, and it's going to take a lot. It's going to take a lot of months of historic levels of, of job growth to um, get us back to where we were um, three months ago. Okay. Um, and then the other thing to say is, uh, in the same way that um, job losses uh, were kind of different across different sorts of industry, the gains have been different across different sorts of industry. So in some industries, uh, there was pretty strong job growth. So leisure and hospitality led the way as businesses started to reopen in some um, states uh, in the country. Restaurants started reopening um, and, and workers were called back to work. Uh, but again, if you look across the different industry patterns here, for example, in manufacturing and education and health and business professional services, all very large employers, um, uh, job growth was pretty, pretty small. Okay? And uh, one important um, uh, note about uh, the change in employment over the last month is that if we look at um, state and local government employment, that actually fell uh, in the last month. And that's happening because 
uh, the economic crisis that's happening right now is really um, pinching off the flow of tax revenue to states. And this employment crisis is rapidly going to turn into a fiscal crisis for a lot of state and local governments. Uh, and with that fiscal crisis, it's going to come a pressure to lay off workers. And um, as, I'll, as I'll return to when we get to the uh, kind of policy uh, recommendation section of, of the talk, uh, heading off those kinds of losses by having the federal government fund um, state and local governments uh, is one of the most important things that, that we can do to prevent um, uh, further employment losses in that sector. Okay, so, so that's just table setting, talking about how the public health crisis has translated into uh, an employment crisis. And we've seen massive job uh, losses. We've seen that those job losses are concentrated amongst more vulnerable populations, people who are uh, racial and ethnic minorities, uh, foreign born, uh, relatively low earning to begin with, uh, and concentrated in the service sectors. Um, so, so how has policy responded? Okay, so this is again a big topic and I know that there have been um, some other seminars that have addressed other parts of the policy response, um, including uh, food, uh, food aid um, and other sorts of aid. Um, today, what I'm really going to focus on is just um, the set of policy responses that are really targeted at the labor market and in particular the unemployment insurance system. Um, so there have been three rounds, uh, maybe three and a half rounds of stimulus, depending on how we're counting. Uh, but the most important of uh, the stimulus bills that Congress has passed so far, uh, by far has been the CARES Act, the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, uh, which was a $2 trillion bill, uh, again, by far the largest stimulus um, that Congress has passed in its history, um, signed at the end of March. Okay? And again, there are a lot of provisions in that bill. There are the direct payments uh, of about $1,000 per adult and another $500 per child uh, for people with incomes below $75,000 or $150,000 per family. Uh, there were changes to um, the SNAP program, uh, pauses on student loan payments, and some other provisions that were all meant to just shore up family resources. Um, but uh, today I want to talk about, uh, in part, um, the other two, uh, uh, two other um, pieces uh, of that legislation. Uh, one is um, a set of loans called Paycheck Protection Loans for Small Businesses. Uh, that were uh, made available to small business and basically designed to cover about eight weeks of uh, businesses payroll uh, with provisions um, that um, the loan can be forgiven uh, if um, uh, employers kind of follow a set of, uh, a set of rules uh, having to do with maintaining the amount of payroll um, that, they're, uh, that they're paying out over that eight week period. So this has been a pretty important program and reaches about 6% of the workforce. Um, I'll just touch on some international comparisons later on. Um, you know, so that 6% number is really relatively low relative to other advanced economies. So a lot of other economies, especially in Europe, Germany, Israel, uh, and some other countries have really focused much more on this sort of uh, uh, approach to keep workers attached to employers through the downturn and really try to support workers by directly subsidizing employers to keep workers on payroll, okay? In the US, that's traditionally not been um, the focus of labor market policy uh, in recessions. Uh, instead, um, in, uh, in the United States, we uh, kind of expect uh, workers, uh, or sorry, uh, firms to lay off their workers and, and then try to um, directly aid the workers um, who have been laid off. Okay, so, uh, uh, so that unemployment insurance system um, uh, uh, had about $250 billion worth of uh, additional funds uh, put into it by the CARES Act. And as I'll talk about in a sec, the, the kind of major things that the CARES Act did on this front was expand eligibility to a lot of workers who traditionally have been left out of the UI system. Um, it extended the duration of eligibility uh, for those benefits. Uh, and really and instituted a really large um, uh, increase in weekly benefits. Okay, so I want to talk about how the unemployment ins insurance system is, is working or not working um, to aid workers who have been laid off. Uh, and um, to do that, I want to talk just a little bit in detail about how UI works in normal times. In other words, how it worked up until these changes that were instituted by the CARES program. Uh, and then uh, just talk about what changes have been made um, uh, uh, under care and how those changes have really impacted 
uh, workers. Okay, so uh, to be eligible for UI, there are a set of eligibility requirements. These are these are kind of generic. Uh, the details of them vary from state to state. Right, UI is administered at the state level, and because of that, the rules vary across different states. I'll talk uh, a little bit about the rules in New York State just as an example. Um, but there, there are kind of four kinds of eligibility requirements, and you can think about what the CARES Act did uh, as essentially modifying each one of these uh, requirements. Um, so first, there are a set of earnings requirements. So these earnings requirements are basically all aimed at uh, limiting eligibility for unemployment insurance to workers who have pretty substantial engagement with the labor market in the kinds of uh, uh, employers that are covered by the UI system. So both of those things are restrictive. In the one case, it's usually about how many hours you've worked uh, or how much you've earned, uh, but then you also need to be sort of in the right kind of uh, employment, and I'll talk about that uh, in a sec. Uh, the second is that you have to be able and available uh, for work. Uh, the third is that you have to be involuntarily unemployed, so you can't have um, quit your job uh, voluntarily uh, and still be eligible. And then fourth, you have to be um, actively searching uh, for work. Now, if you meet all of these categorical eligibility requirements, um, uh, you go into the benefit determination phase. So the level of benefits, again, varies across different states. Uh, but loosely speaking, the way um, UI works is that some fraction of the wages that you earn prior to becoming unemployed are reimbursed to you through the unemployment insurance system. In New York, the way it works is we look at the past uh, uh, of four of the past five quarters uh, in the quarter that you file for unemployment. So ba basically your earnings over the last year before you file for unemployment. Uh, and then, uh, um, depending on how much uh, you've earned in the highest earning quarter uh, over those past uh, four quarters, um, you get roughly 50% uh, of the weekly wage that you earned over um, those, uh, those four quarters. And that's your UI benefit, except that the benefit level is capped, right? So uh, uh, very high uh, earners uh, for whom 50% of their earnings would have been a really big number, uh, can't get any more than $504 a week. Okay, so essentially um, the, the benefit that you get through UI is capped at $504 a week. Now, um, there's partial unemployment insurance. So if an employer has been approved by the Department of Labor, uh, then uh, workers uh, who've had their hours reduced, so not necessarily been laid off, but just had their hours reduced because the, the firm is trying to reduce hours as a way to weather the downturn rather than lay off workers altogether. Um, if hours have been reduced by between 20% and 60%, then workers can still be eligible as long as the, the employer has been approved um, for that sort of program um, by the Department of Labor. Okay. In typical times in most states, um, uh, uh, unemployment insurance eligibility is limited to half a year, 26 weeks. Uh, it's lower in some other states. Um, New York, uh, in times of downturn, as other states often uh, uh, activates what's called an extended benefits program, which adds another 13 weeks of eligibility, bringing your total eligible period to 39 weeks. Um, and then uh, the federal government through Congress often enacts an emergency unemployment uh, uh, compensation program, which um, adds more uh, weeks uh, of eligibility, usually um, a little bit at a time. So for example, in the Great Recession, which lasted a long time, um, the emergency unemployment compensation program uh, added an additional 78 weeks of eligibility uh, in some states because, um, because the recession lasted so long. Uh, in, in, in the Great Recession, uh, um, Congress has sometimes also increased the, the benefit level of UI, the weekly benefit level. So for example, in the Great Recession, they increased that benefit level by $25. Okay? We're about to see under the CARES Act, a lot of these kinds of changes were made, but in a much more aggressive uh, and generous sort of way. Okay, so CARES really dramatically expanded uh, UI um, uh, and created three new federal programs um, to do that. So the first thing that they did, so remember that um, uh, eligibility for UI is typically um, uh, 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 only uh, workers who work in covered employment uh, are eligible. In typical times, that excludes a set of workers. So it usually excludes a lot of part-time workers, freelancers, independent contractors, self-employed workers, often student workers um, get swept into some of those categories. 
uh, through the pandemic unemployment assistance program, uh, those um, restrictions were waived. So now people in those categories, um, sometimes they, they need to uh, uh, kind of meet a set of certification requirements that demonstrate that their unemployment is, is really a result of the COVID crisis. Uh, but in principle, uh, people in those categories are now eligible in a way that they haven't been traditionally. Um, the pandemic emergency unemployment compensation or uh, PUKE, uh, extends duration by um, 13 weeks. So this is a version of the emergency unemployment compensation program that's been uh, announced in previous weeks. Okay, so this adds uh, eligibility for another 13 weeks, bringing the total uh, amount of um, uh, uh, eligibility duration to a full year. Uh, and then finally, and most importantly, um, they enacted a pandemic unemployment compensation program. Uh, which increases payments by $600 per week. So remember in the Great, uh, in the great Recession, uh, Congress increased payments by $25 a week. So this is an increase um, to $600 a week. And importantly, uh, anybody who is uh, eligible for, who has a, a, a valid UI claim or partial UI claim or a claim through this newly created Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program is eligible for that full uh, amount. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you just what a big impact that has uh, on workers' impacts in a moment. The other um, uh, tweaks to the program uh, included eliminating a, a waiting period to receive benefits, although a lot of issues with um, just uh, the system capacity to be able to process the number of applications they've been getting have really uh, kind of made this moot in the sense that a lot of people are just waiting a long time to receive their benefits. Um, uh, and then more importantly, um, uh, the government created an incentive to use um, short time compensation programs or work sharing programs. So these are the programs where again, uh, yeah, uh, if a worker is furloughed, so has their hours reduced by between 20 and 60% um, as a way of uh, the employer cutting payroll, uh, all the expenses associated with unemployment benefits for those short time programs are reimbursable now by the federal government. Okay, so the, the states can be reimbursed for those. So give states an incentive to really um, push uh, employers to take advantage of those programs. This has been a really underused um, program in my opinion. Now, one thing I just wanna note in passing and then come back to is that these are really unprecedented changes and really direct a lot of resources to unemployed workers. But the other way of looking at this is that the existing unemployment insurance system in current law prior to the pandemic really has a number of glaring uh, deficiencies, a number of workers that it never reaches um, who are disproportionately women and people of color. And a lot of the changes here are really um, just addressing some of those issues. Um, okay, so how, how do these changes affect uh, workers' incomes? So um, uh, the figure that I have here is just showing uh, for workers as a function of how much they're making every week, Okay, that's uh, what's here on the bottom axis. The line is just showing how much they would earn uh, if they're employed, which is just their weekly earnings again. If you earn $500 a week, you get uh, $500 if you're employed. And then the gray line is showing, you know, prior to CARES, uh, how much income would you make? Now in New York State, the replacement rate of earnings through the unemployment insurance system is about 50%. That's on the higher end uh, among states. Um, but um, you can see that under a normal uh, unemployment insurance um, uh, rules, people's earnings would be replaced at about a 50% rate if they become unemployed. Okay? So the gap here is just the earnings loss that, uh, that people experience when they go from being employed to uh, unemployed. And you can see that once you get out to about $1,000 in weekly earnings, uh, that's when you hit that cap in benefits. So anybody who earns $1,000 or more is just gonna get 500. Uh, $504 for maximum benefit. What I want to show you is just what, how the change in CARES has affected uh, how much um, income workers are, are able to get. Okay, you can see uh, what's happening here is basically this whole line is shifting up by $600, right? And that's really being driven uh, entirely by these pandemic unemployment compensation systems. The other thing that uh, the, the um, CARES Act did is it waived the earnings requirements. So it used to be that people who were earning very low amounts uh, in employment were not eligible for UI benefits at all. Okay, now they are. Okay, so you can see one of the really striking things about this figure and one of the things that's driving a lot of debate about this program uh, 
is that for anybody who's making under $1,000 or so per week, this is in New York, okay, it's different um, from state to state depending on uh, how high their benefit levels are. But in New York, anybody who's making under a little bit over $1,000 a week uh, would actually see higher total income uh, uh, as an unemployed person than they would if they remained employed. Okay? And that's really just driven by the fact that that $600 a week is a very generous uh, benefit. So $600 a week in addition to the normal uh, amount of UI that people would get. So you get 50% of your earnings uh, and then add the $600 that uh, gives you more income than you had um, before you were unemployed. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Another thing that I really want to stress is these incentives uh, in the app to, um, uh, to support work sharing uh, can be really beneficial to, uh, to workers. So I want to stress that in order for workers to be eligible for these benefits, their employer needs to get approval from the Department of Labor uh, in order to have a short-term uh, unemployment insurance um, uh, program. But if they do do that, then um, if, if you're furloughed at least 20%, so between 20 and 60%, okay, then you're eligible for the full uh, $600, okay? So for example, if a worker is furloughed one day a week, uh, then their earnings are reduced by uh, 20%, so they still get 80% of their earnings. And in normal times, they would get uh, a prorated share of their unemployment benefit. So they would get another 20% of their unemployment benefit but now they get 20% of that unemployment benefit, but plus the full $600 of the pandemic unemployment compensation system. So what that means is for anybody earning up to really a, a very high salary, over $150,000 in New York, would actually see higher wages being furloughed one day a week um, uh, than if uh, they remained um, uh, fully employed. Okay, so this is really a, a very generous benefit. Um, I, I want to um, speed up a little bit just to um, make sure I leave some time for, for questions at the end here. Um, what I showed you was just for New York. There's been research that has kind of generalized what I showed you and uh, for, the, for the full country. Um, and, you know, loosely speaking, the same kinds of results hold for workers um, uh, who uh, have relatively low weekly earnings. Uh, uh, being unemployed and receiving unemployment insurance through CARES, as long as you get it, uh, actually boosts your income overall. Uh, so anybody earning up to about $1,000 a week nationally who's eligible for UI stands to, stands to gain income from being unemployed. And if you look across um, different occupations and just think about uh, <clears throat> how somebody with the median wages uh, in each of these occupations, so for food service here, <clears throat> Uh, at the left of this figure, janitors, medical assistants, sales, retail, transport, construction, even teachers, uh, for all of them earning the, the median wage, they would stand to uh, gain income overall uh, if they uh, were unemployed in the CQI. Uh, and that's purely driven by that $600 a week benefit. <clears throat> um, now, what I've showed you so far is just simulation evidence. Okay, um, the figure here is, is showing, you know, perhaps surprising data uh, from the Bureau of Economic uh, Analysis and the Census Department showing that, uh, in fact, in April, uh, personal income rose despite the massive job losses, again, the 20 million job loss. Okay, and that's entirely driven by the fact that um, the benefits through UI have been um, so generous that uh, it's, it's driven up uh, personal income on average, okay? One thing that's, that's worthwhile noting is that while we had record uh, growth in uh, personal income, that same month saw record um, declines in consumption spending. And that's a useful warning because it shows that, you know, just supporting people's incomes is not enough to get the economy back on track. We really need to make people feel safe um, spending their money and address the public health crisis uh, in order to, to keep the economy uh, on, on track. The other thing that's really important to note is this is an average, okay? This is an average, and we know uh, that historically people have not uh, received UI, okay? So this figure shows that uh, not all workers who file are receiving their UI benefits. So the Treasury Department uh, estimates that only, uh, or sorry, that only about two thirds of people, uh, of the benefits that people are eligible for have been paid out uh, so far. So people aren't getting the benefits even that they've already uh, filed for and are eligible for. And, and perhaps more importantly, 
in historic, uh, in, in usual times, only about a third of people who end up unemployed end up receiving unemployment insurance benefits. And there are big differences across race and gender uh, in who actually ends up uh, receiving benefits. And a lot of that has to do with whether workers are uh, uh, part of the gig economy or part-time uh, or otherwise working uh, uh, with high enough wages to qualify for UI. Okay. And we see um, that the latest data shows that a lot of those kind of historical patterns of uh, inequitable access to UI benefits are being repeated in this crisis. So African Americans are, uh, who are unemployed are receiving UI benefits at, at less than half the rate um, as their white counterparts. Um, a lot of that is um, because of, uh, you can see that the gaps in how many people have applied or tried to apply for benefits are not that large, but there are really big differences in, in who's actually getting through. Um, let me skip over that to keep going. The, the one thing that, that I want to stress, and just e echoing this point that a lot of workers are not being aided, and a lot of workers are really um, seeing harm, is that if you look on data on material hardships, so this figure is just showing trends in food insecurity, uh, a particularly severe form of material hardship, we see really massive increases in food insecurity that have happened um, uh, from prior to this pandemic to, um, uh, to April. And so it's clear that um, the UI system, although it's uh, really increasing the incomes of people who are receiving it, um, there are a lot of people who the system is just missing um, and, uh, and, and are not doing uh, as well as, as they should be. Um, okay, so um, I want to briefly um, uh, kind of gloss over uh, an international comparison. The, the punchline here is just to say that you know, we, we often kind of focus on uh, the U.S. and kind of think that um, uh, uh, we might be at the, the frontier of policy or um, it can be hard to imagine, you know, whether, whether we could have had a different situation or we could have addressed this differently. Uh, what the, the kind of juxtaposition of these two figures shows, showing the trend in, in daily COVID cases uh, on the left-hand side, and then the change in the unemployment rates uh, across um, several different uh, advanced economies is just that, you know, the U.S. has really seen uh, kind of a uniquely large increase in unemployment. Now, it's true that the, the increase in COVID cases has been greater in the United States than in Canada. Um, but other countries that have seen relatively large increases in COVID uh, have uh, managed to prevent that public health crisis from filtering into an, em an employment crisis much better than we have. So the, the countries that I call your attention to in particular are um, uh, uh, Germany, especially uh, in Australia to a lesser extent where they saw relatively large spikes in COVID crisis, although they've been, they've been managed much better and the, the um, caseloads have been driven down much quicker in those countries than, than in ours. But a lot of the, the reasons for these differences come back to uh, what I mentioned earlier is that these countries have really chosen a different way to support workers uh, and have uh, used uh, policies much more like the Paycheck Protection Plan to subsidize workers directly in their employers to prevent them from ever being separated uh, from, uh, from their employer. Okay, so because of that, unemployment has risen much less uh, and you've seen much less of an impact on a lot of um, worker outcomes uh, as a result. Okay. Um, uh, okay, so predicting the future uh, is dicey. Uh, I've already told you, um, you know, some of the successes that economists have had in predicting uh, the future when I told you that economists expected a 7 million uh, uh, jobs lost in May, but we actually saw a 2 million jobs gained. So, so take the following all with a grain of salt. Um, but, um, you know, one question has just been, you know, is the small uptick in jobs that we saw in May likely to continue? And that's a hard question to answer. We don't have great data at really uh, 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 kind of high frequency level to be able to get a good handle on that. But the data that we do have um, is relatively promising. So we have some alternate data sources like um, payroll management companies like Kronos, which I'm sure a lot of you use in, in, in your jobs uh, to register your time. Uh, uh, time being worked um, shows just trends and payroll uh, punches over time and shows that uh, um, through from uh, late April through May uh, and into the first week of June, we've actually seen increases uh, in um, workers uh, kind of punching the time clock uh, uh, digitally. Um, so suggesting that employment is indeed um, continuing to recover. Um, uh, the New York Times ran an interesting uh, article about 
uh, just the lens of looking at um, the uh, um, dent, uh, workers in, in dentist's office, which accounted for nearly a tenth of the, the job gains that we saw in the last month. And you can see that um, dentist office are really beginning to pull uh, their workers back like uh, over the recession. So, uh, you know, going from only 11% of their staff fully being at work to 77% um, of their staff uh, the week of June 1st. So we see, you know, in this kind of a business where, you know, you would think that COVID, this kind of fear of consumers of, of contracting the disease by coming into, into interaction with people is really the only thing preventing something from coming back you kind of get a sense that um, in this um, industry, at least, we do see a big rebound in employment that's continuing into June. Now, one kind of caveat to this is policy may be uh, playing a role here and may make some of these gains look artificial. So one of the provisions of the Paycheck Protection uh, Loans is that employers need to show that they've maintained payroll at a certain level uh, at the end of an eight-week period. And so uh, a lot of dentist office uh, took advantage of those loans and we might see some uh, kind of rehiring or recalling people from furlough just to kind of satisfy the forgiveness terms of, of those kinds of loans. Um, another uh, another um, big um, uh, thing to pay attention to in this crisis is that uh, unemployment's likely to be a lot longer than workers uh, expect. So in the most recent um, survey of workers, almost 80% of them expect that their layoff is just temporary. They're going to be recalled to their workers. They're going to be recalled to their employer. You can see that that's never happened before. We've never had a situation like this where there's been massive job losses, but almost everybody laid off expected that they'd, they'd come back to their job. Okay. Economists think that this is, is far too optimistic. So the most recent study suggests that 40% uh, of the layoffs rather than the 20% um, that the workers' um, opinions would suggest, maybe 40% of the layoffs are likely to become permanent. And that number is likely to go up the longer um, the crisis continues, okay? So um, uh, another uh, feature here is, is just, you know, we think that the number of permanent layoffs or the share of permanent layoffs is gonna go up the longer unemployment continues, um, you know, the lesson of history is that recessions take a long time to recover from and they're taking longer and longer. So if we look at the Great Recession, okay, where uh, at the peak, uh, un the unemployment rate or, or jobs uh, uh, were lost by only about 6%, whereas now we're, we're down 14%. Um, uh, even that recession took, uh, you know, more than six years to recover from, more than six years for jobs to get back to their level. Okay. So you can see we've started to make progress uh, in the last month, but history suggests that it's going to take a long time. Now, you know, again, we, we've seen nothing like this in history, so history might not be the best time. But um, again, history kind of suggests uh, caution and being overly optimistic. So what about um, thinking about which jobs are going to come back first? So this is going to be a lot about just managing, uh, again, workers and, and consumers' fears over uh, being in contact with other people. There are a lot of ways to think about how that's going to cut across employment across different sorts of sectors. So um, this is based on uh, uh, research um, that economists have done recently that characterizes different businesses basically by how crowded uh, an establishment can be. So how many visits they get in a week per square foot that the establishment has and then how long the typical customer tends to stay. And the idea is um, uh, as you get more crowded and as you uh, have more visitors, that's gonna be riskier, right? So the, the firms that are located down here, so this big, huge circle that you see right here, that's a Walmart, for example. Uh, you know, visitors come, they stay for a while, but not too, too long. Um, uh, but the, the space is massive, so it's easier to socially distance. Those are the kinds of places that are likely to come back first. You can see fast food restaurants. Okay? So fast food restaurants tend to get a lot, of, uh, a lot of visitors relative to the space they have, but the visits are short. Um, so uh, that suggests that things might not be so bad. Um, in gyms, uh, people stay for a long time, uh, but, um, uh, 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 but there tends to be a lot of space for them to distance. So again, um, gyms might have a chance at reopening relatively early. On the other hand, um, you know, sit-down restaurants are kind of uh, the kind of classic case of a place that, that's going to be hard to reopen, right? Without uh, kind of operating that substantially below full capacity to be able to um, sit people further apart from one another, it's going to be hard for them uh, to reopen.
Okay. So there's some other dimensions to this. Uh, I won't go into this much further other than to say uh, a lot of the types of places where risks are the highest, so the service sector, where, where there tend to be a lot of interaction between workers uh, and, um, and customers at close range, tend to employ lower wage workers. Those are uh, unfortunately the, the kinds of businesses that are gonna be slow to recover. Um, I wanna um, quickly uh, talk about um, policy. Okay, so the, the big kind of policy issues on the table for the next round of, um, of stimulus are, you know, should we be more like Germany? Should, should we do a lot more to aid workers where they are, expand these paycheck protection loans, and try to incentivize workers staying together with, uh, with firms, like not severing those uh, employment relationships? This is a big debate. The issue is basically whether, uh, you know, it's good never to sever that un unemployment uh, relationship, uh, and you know, prevent uh, workers from having longer unemployment spells uh, where, where they go for a long period of time needing government assistance, uh, having to search, potentially facing really long-term job losses. Uh, and the counterpoint to that is just whether um, kind of encouraging people to go on to unemployment insurance system uh, when, when they're laid off and then start searching for other jobs prevents them from waiting around for a job that's not gonna come back. Okay, so one of the big questions here is just again, are those uh, uh, businesses that are receiving paycheck protection loans actually gonna survive this? Uh, if they don't, uh, then there's no job for that worker to go back to. And it may have been better to have them on unemployment insurance so they could have started looking for a new job earlier. Um, the other big argument here uh, at a macro level is just about whether generous benefits prevent workers from going back to work. So you've seen um, this talked about in the news. This is a talking point of a lot of uh, uh, Republican legislators that we really need to scale back the $600 a week uh, unemployment insurance benefit because it's basically making unemployment too attractive. So workers won't want to come back to the labor market as the recovery begins and, and it's going to, to hinder it. Okay. Um, research on, on that topic has suggested that there's relatively um, little effect of the benefits of, of, um, uh, of these kinds of um, programs in kind of preventing people from going, uh, from people going back to work. Most people want to work uh, to the extent that they don't. Uh, an important consideration here is just having a generous um, social safety net uh, be a competitor uh, to low wage work. Okay. And, and the important thing here is just really for the social safety net to be generous enough to give workers more leverage when they're going back to work to give them a, a decent enough outside option that they can choose not to go back to work uh, if they believe that their employer hasn't done enough to create a safe environment uh, for them to be able to do so in a way that doesn't jeopardize their health and the health of their families. And so there are a lot of, uh, a lot of considerations uh, along uh, those lines. Um, Tiffany, I know I'm, I'm coming up on uh, time. Um, I kind of have a set of uh, policy priorities um, that I think um, the federal government really needs to take on, um, which, which kind of starts with uh, addressing the public health crisis and then doing other things to really strengthen the safety net. Um, uh, again, both to shelter workers uh, from the storm and then also just to give them some bargaining power to be able to uh, go back to work in a more equitable uh, and just way as, as the economy starts to recover. Um, uh, for uh, practitioners, for the, 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 uh, a lot of uh, people that I mentioned on the call, um, you know, there's, there's not um, uh, a lot that, that research has to say about how exactly uh, workers um, should weather a crisis like this. Um, job training is important and, and no doubt it's going to become important as the economy starts to recover, but that's not the problem right now. The problem right now is that, you know, businesses aren't open. Um, we have this health crisis and that's preventing the economy from restarting. Once it does, we're going to start to see a lot of businesses close down. People are going to need to start thinking about changing the sectors that they're working in. Um, and uh, attaching um, job seekers to sectoral training programs, you know, um, things like uh, um, doing uh, certificate programs to become a licensed nurse, uh, you know, medical coding, things of that nature. There's a lot of research support that these kinds of sectoral training programs uh, uh, have really large, uh, can have large impacts on, on workers' earnings. 
Um, but finding high quality programs is going to be tough, especially if the continued health crisis pushes a lot of those programs online, where we know that, uh, you know, workers who traditionally had um, kind of low attachment to post-secondary education um, uh, tend to struggle. So, um, you know, finding high quality programs is going to be a challenge just because the quality of those programs may not be what it was uh, by reputation before the crisis happened. And then the other piece of advice is just um, kind of just building on this theme of uh, the recession is likely to last much longer than, than workers think. Uh, and it's likely um, that a lot of people who are expecting to be recalled are not going to have a job to go back to because, because those employers are going are gonna, to um, face bankruptcy. Um, suggest that it's really important to, to get workers who are laid off um, but expecting to be recalled to start making contingency plans, what, what they'll do, like where they'll start looking. Uh, for employment when their uh, employers are shutting down. There's a lot of research that suggests that the workers who are expecting to be recalled from temporary layoff who end up not being recalled are the workers who are hurt the most uh, in economic downturns. And that's because they just start their job search so much later than everybody else, making it much harder for them to, to compete to find the, the scarce um, number of jobs that are, are becoming available uh, in the upturn. So. Uh, let me stop there. I, I know I've gone over time, but um, I'm, I'm happy to take questions to the extent that there is time. All right. Thank you, Jordan, so much. So um, we are going to, we'll take a couple questions um, and then um, we'll let everybody get going on with their day. Um, one question that came in was um, regards to the CARES Act, how will it affect us in a long run? Will like taxes be increased by a significant amount? Um, in order to cover it, like what are going to be the implications of, of the CARE Act? Yeah, so so almost certainly you're going to see calls for um, just, uh, you know, improving the fiscal position of the federal government. Um, so that no doubt is going to happen. Um, you know, this is a, a kind of fraught political issue. I think the, the kind of current thinking amongst um, uh, most economists is that the size of the national debt is not, uh, a kind of major determinant of economic performance uh, going forward. So the fact that, you know, we're likely to add, um, uh, you know, a couple trillion dollars uh, in debt to the, in, to the deficit is not a reason for panic. Um, it's just kind of a reason for, uh, for slow, um, slow and steady progress. But, uh, you know, the, this is going to be something that's litigated more in the political sphere than, um, than in the idea sphere, I'm afraid. And um, uh, I'm sure um, that there are going to be pushes to um, more likely cut spending than pushes to, to increase taxes. But both of those things realistically uh, will need to start happening over the long run to, to start to pay off um, all the spending that we're doing right now. You know, um, it, it's kind of a trope to say that the best um, cure for deficits is just to, um, uh, to rebuild the, the economy, have strong economic growth and increase tax revenues just with existing tax rates uh, because incomes are going up overall. So that, that, that's the best case scenario is just to focus on rebuilding the economy uh, and get tax revenues uh, coming back in uh, in that sort of way rather than um, doing anything to do that right now. Certainly, I don't think, um, you know, now as we're, we're trying to uh, get the economy restarted is, is the time to, to tackle increases uh, in taxes or um, declines in spending. You know, one of the, one of the false trade-offs that I think um, uh, happens in Washington uh, is that people think that they can um, uh, decrease spending and, um, you know, that's just a net win from the, the federal budget perspective. Uh, but in fact, a lot of the social spending is on re really critical supports for families, uh, for schools, um, things that are themselves increasing the productive capacity of our future workforce. And um, if we cut those programs, we're going to um, kind of hurt our economy and our competitiveness in the long term um, and, uh, and, and even uh, hurt the, the federal government's fiscal, perspective, uh, fiscal standing because uh, as the productive capacity of, of the population declines, you know, tax, uh, tax revenues declines. So there are a lot of programs that have been shown um, to actually increase uh, federal government revenues over the long term, even after you kind of net out what the federal government is spending in real time. Thank you, Jordan. Um, another question that we got from an audience member is, um, and I'm looking back at your slides, um, I think this is going over the slides, um, the slide 15, 
regarding the eligibility requirements for unemployment benefits. So when um, so when looking at those requirements, one of the one of them is um, be actively searching for work. And how is this defined? What does looking for employment look like um, in regards to the uh, um, eligibility requirement? Yeah. Um, so, so in normal times, uh, people usually need to certify for their, their benefits. So they um, you know, need to fill out a weekly form to the Department of Labor um, that certifies that they continue to meet the eligibility criteria. And um, the way they would meet that particular criterion is just describe uh, what they've done uh, over the course of the week to, to look for jobs and sometimes show documentation for that. So, for example, uh, show, you know, like, um, you know, here's the uh, resume that I sent in to company X or, um, you know, otherwise demonstrate that you've actually uh, been searching. Um, that's one of the requirements that's been uh, waived uh, during the during the pandemic. So, you know, understanding that people aren't uh, uh, able, or well, first that uh, firms just are not hiring right now, and so there may not be jobs to search for, uh, and also that um, you know, just the public health situation prevents um, uh, prevents workers from being out there looking for work. Um, uh, most states have made exceptions to those rules in this time. Okay, thank you. Um, this next question is actually going to be going back to um, your slide seven. Um, in regards to the chart, are the foreign-born um, figures including undocumented individuals? Yes. So those right. So that's not broken down by um, that's not broken down by um, uh, 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 legal immigration status uh, by documented status. Um, so that, that's just all foreign-born workers together. So th there has been research um, separately on uh, the impact of the crisis on undocumented workers. And, um, you know, that, that's one group that's particularly hurt by uh, the crisis. So you've both seen uh, kind of big declines in employment, and those workers are also not eligible for UI uh, or a lot of the other benefits um, that the federal government has put into place. Um, so the story is much um, uh, kind of bleaker, it, it, you know, kind of um, sl slightly more severe than that figure would suggest uh, for foreign workers overall, just on their unemployment rate. Uh, but more importantly, the impact of unemployment on their family resources has been much more negative just because they're not eligible for a lot of the supports that, um, that the federal government has put into place. All right, thank you. We'll just take a, we'll do a couple more questions. Um, another question that came in from the audience is, how is it that people of color and women don't benefit as much from UI? Can you share more about this? Yeah, so a lot of that, um, it, you know, this, this is, um, uh, there's, there's kind of a long and horrible history uh, to this. So, that, I mean, this has kind of always um, been the case, you know, when, when UI was created back in the 1930s, uh, there was a lot of pushback by, um, you know, farmers, um, uh, you know, a, a lot of Southern Democrats um, uh, who, you know, were worried that a more generous uh, UI system would, um, uh, you know, kind of mean that a lot of their workers wouldn't be willing to work for the wages that they were paying and so on. And so, you, you know, from its inception in the UI programs, there have been a lot of eligibility requirements that, you know, at least if you go back to the history, were very explicitly racist and, um, and uh, exclusionary by design um, to try to prevent certain workers from being eligible uh, um, for those benefits as a way of um, uh, kind of uh, buying the support of, uh, of business back when it was created. Now, over time, there's been kind of slow um, and steady progress in expanding uh, eligibility, um, but, you know, in more recent times in the Great Recession and so on, there's been some retrenchment as, as states have kind of increasingly run into um, uh, kind of fiscal problems. They've kind of made those, um, those benefits more restrictive. So, so the reason today why you continue to see those kinds of disparity, um, um, uh, discrepancies in UI receipt by race and gender, uh, again, comes back to uh, the fact well, there are a couple of different things. So probably the, the largest reason is just those, those eligibility rules explicitly uh, kind of cut out the types of employment that uh, race and ethnic minorities and women tend to be employed in. So people who are in the contingent workforce, people who are uh, working part-time, 
uh, independent contractors, um, you know, might be working under the table. Um, uh, so people who are just working in jobs that are not um, uh, that are not uh, covered by the unemployment and system again by design. Um, so the the other category is just uh, uh, having sufficient uh, labor force attachment. So uh, race and ethnic minorities and women tend to have uh, more churn in their jobs uh, in, in the labor market. And in, in order to qualify for UI, generally you need to have been attached to the labor market. Um, uh, uh, and if you've been switching jobs and only earning uh, a, a relatively low amount uh, over the past year, then uh, often um, you won't be eligible for UI. All right, thank you so much, Jordan. Um, we're just gonna do one last question before we um, close off here, close out here. Um, this is coming from Victoria. She's asking how closely tied are the unemployment offices and US employers? Um, since the system is missing a lot of vulnerable people, are there existing privacy laws that protect workers to stay on UI benefits or get economic security otherwise? Uh, I'm not sure I follow that question. Is, is the question, um, you know, whether, uh, whether the UI system is communicating back to employers, like the benefits that, that workers are receiving? Victoria, if you're on, you can go ahead and respond in the chat box too. But I would also like recommend from your interpretation, Jordan, uh, I'm start answering it from there. Um, so I, I actually, don't, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, I, I don't believe it's the case that um, the UI system communicates back to uh, back to employers, you know, what benefits a worker is receiving. Okay. Um, and Victoria did elaborate further. She's saying, she's wondering really what existing, um, what um, essentially what are existing US laws and policies that can protect vulnerable workers receiving UI? In a privacy context, do you mean? Yeah, I, I, I think I think the, the short answer is that I, I don't think I know enough about that to, to speak um, to speak to it. I, I don't think it's the case that the Department of Labor discloses back to employers uh, at an individual level what sort of benefits have been receiving, uh, what what sort of benefits their individual workers have been receiving. Um, but but I don't I don't know um, the lay uh, of the land um, of uh, of the set of privacy laws that apply um, there. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for thank you for taking a stab at that question. Um, and essentially, just we want to do go ahead and wrap up and just respect for everybody's time. Um, and thank you, everybody. And um, Jordan, I'm not sure if you were able to see the um, the chat box throughout your presentation, but there are a lot of questions. There are a lot of um, comments. Just thanking you so much for this information, um, and just how clear and um, how clear. Um, that it was how clear and well well laid out it, it, it was and so thank you for your time today um for everybody joining in from all over we really appreciate you guys